Hello. We're going to continue our discussion of Chapter 1, Section 1. Uh, previously, we discussed the concept of history, and we talked about what are the tools and strategies and methods that are used by different kinds of historians. Now we need to begin discussing human beings, um, since history is, in many ways, uh, the study of humans and their impact on the world. Um, we need to start figuring out where did humans come from. So uh, we're going to begin by talking about uh, prehistoric man. You'll remember that prehistory is the era of human history before the invention and use of writing. So when we say prehistoric man, we're talking about man before writing. Okay. Now, very little was surprisingly known about humans or their earliest ancestors uh, until really recently. Um, the 1950s. Um, and there are reasons for this. You'll remember that I said that the two sources that historians use to gain knowledge about the past are artifacts and written evidence. But prehistoric man couldn't leave behind written evidence because obviously there's no writing. Right? And uh, they couldn't really leave behind many artifacts because there were very, very few of them to leave behind. Um, the farther back you go in history, the smaller human populations are, the smaller a human population is, or some human-like ancestors population is, the fewer artifacts they're going to leave behind. Um, and so they're going to be harder to find. They're also going to be less advanced artifacts. And the artifacts are going to look very, very, very similar to just normal natural objects, which are very difficult to, to spot. So, um, really surprising when you hear that 1950s date, but in reality, when you think about where historians get their information, it makes sense. But eventually, um, archaeologists did find evidence for prehistoric uh, creatures, man-like creatures, uh, in East Africa. Um, and there are many scholars that have studied and continue to study uh, prehistoric man today. But the names that we are going to focus on are the Leakeys, Mary and Louis Leakey, and Donald Johnson. Okay. We're going to go through each of those now. So here's an image of Mary and Louis Leakey uh, later in their careers, as you can see. Um, the Leakeys were working in what is called Old Duvai Gorge in modern day Tanzania okay, in the 1930s. Now you'll notice I already said 1950s is when we started to get the evidence. 1930s is when they were started working. So there's a 20 year gap already that we've brought up here. Um, and they were working in Old Divai Gorge uh, and trying to find all of these, you know, they were just doing their job. They were, they were working as archeologists. Um, and the things that they found in this gorge, uh, they could date to about 1.7 to 2.1 million years old. So the things that they originally found as they were starting, so around the 1930s, they were finding this evidence of prehistoric man or prehistoric man-like creatures, um, uh, and they could date it to a, a long, long, long time ago. Okay? Now the question is, what did they find? Um, uh, they found stone tools, very rough stone tools. And when I talk about rough stone tools, I'm talking about things that almost look exactly like regular, unworked, un, you know, treated stones. They are extremely, extremely natural looking. Um, our textbook has some very good images that show you that they really do look barely anything more like rocks, but they are tools. There is evidence that, that creatures have worked on them and, and changed them so that they could suit their needs. And um, the Leakeys, therefore, found evidence of early, early technology, um, uh, which our textbook defines as skills and tools people use to meet their basic needs and wants. Okay, so it may have been very basic. You know, these may have been rocks that were just slightly modified from other rocks, um, but um, these counted as pieces of technology. And the most important thing was that once they figured out that these tools were around in this area, this gorge, that meant that the person or persons or creatures that made those tools also had to be around in this vicinity. So uh, they kept working. And in 1959, so 29 years after they had started their, their work, they finally discovered the skull of an early hominid creature. Okay? Now, hominids are uh, uh, a, a 
class of creatures that we're going to be talking about in great detail. Um, hominids, according to our textbook, include humans and their closest relatives that walk upright. Um, and our textbook says that humans are the only hominids alive today. Now, there's a small change to this that I'll, I'll, I'll uh, add here is that um, uh, the definition of hominid has changed uh, since our textbook was published. Uh, and now humans are not the only hominids alive today. Um, there's another term, hominin, which more appropriately would, uh, that definition would apply to, um, because now hominids includes some of the apes um, uh, found in nature now. So a slight um, change to what our textbook has said, um, uh, but for our purposes in the class, if you know this definition as written in the textbook, I won't punish you for not being aware of the updated information. But they found a skull of an early human-like creature, uh, something that is uh, classified by our textbook as a hominid creature. Okay. So that was our first step in figuring out what may have been going on uh, with early humans and human-like ancestors. After the leakies, we talk about Donald Johnson. Okay, He is, with his famous find, Lucy. Um, Lucy uh, uh, was a set of skeletal remains, which you can see in the picture there, which Johansson found in uh, 1974, working in Ethiopia. So again, take a note of the, the time here. The Leakey started in the 1930s. They found their skull in 1959. And now Johansson is finding his in uh, 1974. Okay. You'll never need to know any of these dates, but it's just interesting to see how long it takes between these two big finds. And uh, he uh, found this more complete skeleton. Okay? The Leakeys found a single skull, okay? um, but Johansson found a full or mostly full skeleton. Okay? And uh, he dated it uh, to at least 3 million years old. So he found uh, something that was even older than some of the tools that the Leakeys were finding. Um, and what was exciting about his find was that because it was a set of lots of bones all together, like you can see in the image here, they could actually start to figure out what one of these early hominid creatures might have looked like and lived like, because the more bones you have from an organism, the fuller a picture you'll get of what that organism might have been like and what their life had been like. If you find a single bone, uh, uh, you know, you can only piece together a certain amount of things. But if you find a huge number of bones or a lot of bones, you start to get a fuller picture. So Johansson's find, Lucy, which he named after um, the Beatles song, Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. But uh, Lucy, this find, um, was important because it was the first chance for anthropologists to get a more complete picture of what was going on with prehistoric creatures, uh, man-like creatures. Whereas uh, the Leakies were famous because they were some of the earliest finds, not the most full or complete finds, but some of the earliest finds. So those are the scholars that found uh, these early finds. And now the question is, what does this tell us? What did they and other uh, anthropologists and archeologists who are working on prehistoric hominid groups, um, what did they find? What's the picture of what we look like today? Now, we're gonna go through and kind of give you a rough timeline of how we got from the earliest human-like ancestors to today's Homo sapiens. Um, but um, we're leaving out many, 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 many intermediary steps in between these different groups. So we're going to go through kind of step by step, um, go from uh, something that's very unlike human and towards something that is very human-like. Um, but note that we're not hitting every single step along the way. And if this was a uh, a class that was just on prehistoric hominids, we could we could go for days and days. Um, but we're only going to break it down to sort of the highlights of the process of getting from prehistoric human-like creatures to humans themselves. Okay, so the earliest sort of noteworthy development to talk about here uh, is a group of creatures called the Australopithecines. Okay, these are the earliest hominids, okay, so the earliest examples of hominids that we have, human-like creatures, okay, that were, have been our earliest ancestors. Um, Lucy, the find that Johansson had, so if we go back and look, Lucy here is one of these uh, um, 
watch the lipidocenes, okay? Um, we can figure out based on their remains that these creatures were bipedal, meaning that they walked on two feet. Their average height was somewhere between four and five feet tall, and they may have been between 66 and 121 pounds. I'm never going to ask you these things, by the way, on a test. You'll never need to know um, these numbers. Um, just try, I just say these things to give you a sense of how big they are for scale. They were found in Africa, uh, and they emerged in Africa somewhere around 7 million years ago. Okay. Um, and that's the earliest group, okay, the, the noteworthy for being the earliest hominids that we should pay attention to. The next step along the evolutionary path, okay, uh, and we'll talk about evolution in a secondary set of, of videos or lectures, um, but the next big step on the road to getting us to something a little bit more human, okay, is uh, this creature, which is called Homo habilis, which means something like handyman. They are noteworthy because they are the first to make stone tools, um, primarily for use for cutting or scraping, chopping, and sawing at the materials that they were getting from nature. Okay. So Lucy, famous for being the first earliest hominid. Homo habilis, famous or important because that's the first stone tools. Okay. Now, their tools were not great. <laughs> they were not fancy. Um, they probably were only giving them a marginally better improvement um, than just doing things without tools. But that small marginal improvement was just enough to really make their, their, um, uh, cre this group of creatures extremely successful. Um, but they're not hunters. Um, just because they have tools doesn't mean they're running around creating like spears and going hunting after animals. Um, these really are not uh, uh, advanced tools. So it's important to note that we're talking tool use, but we're not talking sort of hunters. Okay? Um, specifically, the thing that helped them, um, the thing that was great about the tools was it allowed them to um, get better access to the materials they needed, but specifically, it allowed them to improve their diet. Um, they could eat lots of different things. Um, they had a lot of different options for when it came to what food they could eat. And the tools allowed them to process their food and acquire their food more easily. Um, and of course, having a, a less specialized diet, meaning you can eat lots of different things, means that you're going to be more likely to survive as a species. So these guys uh, thrived, um, partially because of their tools, but also just because they expanded their diet. Scholars say that the Homo habilis is the least similar to humans uh, in terms of appearance, um, they would say that other groups look more like humans. Um, that might be a bit subjective in our minds, but I'll trust the scientists on that. Um, and in terms of the timing, these creatures emerged about 2 million years ago. So that means that if Lucy and the Australopithecines are 7 million years ago, okay, there's a 5 million year gap between Australopithecines and Homo habilis. It took 5,000 years to get to the point where we have tool use in a meaningful way. So really think about the time differences here and the gaps of space between time. Okay. This group of creatures, Homo habilis, may have existed alongside of the next group that we're gonna talk about for about 500,000 years. So a little bit of overlap between them and Homo erectus, the upright man. That's what the erect port of their name means, upright. We call them Homo erectus because they are fully upright walkers. They don't hunch over when they walk, okay? And they emerged about 2 million years ago. Like I said, they probably coexisted with the Homo habilis for a little while, about 500,000 years. Their brains were larger, uh, their bones were larger, so they were growing in size compared to some of the earlier hominids. Um, uh, and they had smaller teeth, which might seem like a backward step to you, um, but if you are using more tools to do your work for you, then you don't need bigger teeth to take care of things like um, uh, tearing flesh and uh, working with your food, right? So um, it seems like a step backward to, to get smaller teeth, but what it means is that the need for smaller teeth or the need for larger teeth is going away because that means they're being successful in other things, namely tool use. Homo erectus is notable because they likely were the first to use fire, although they probably weren't using it for cooking. 
Um, and their tools were improved versions of what we saw with Homo habilis um, that could be used for a wider variety of things. They were noteworthy, especially for uh, these kind of hand axe things that we find everywhere around Homo erectus sites. They may have been uh, the first group to have some sort of primitive language um, that we hadn't seen before. And this group uh, of hominids is probably the first to migrate out of Africa. We'll talk about the migrations of these different groups and how they spread, but the general gist of it is these early groups like the Australopithecines and Homo habilis all arise in Africa. And as their populations grow, they need to spread out. And as they spread out, they start moving farther away from the central parts of Africa. And so Homo erectus is probably the first group that was able to leave Africa uh, for one reason or another. They're about 5 feet 10 inches in height. So just note a general increasing in size uh, as we go down the evolutionary uh, path. All right. And now the final group, the group that we care about the most, Homo sapiens. This is us. Uh, we emerged around 250,000 years ago, right? And again, just think about the time scale, right? 250,000 years ago compared to Lucy, who was 7 million years ago. So think about how long of a process it took for us to get from here to here. Okay? We're not really sure where our origins lie. We may have migrated out of Africa, just like the rest of the uh, Homo erectus did. Um, some people think that the Homo erectus developed into Homo sapiens so that uh, we were not a separate group, but we might have just developed uh, out of Homo erectus. Not really quite sure. What we do know, though, is that Homo sapiens um, were comprised of two groups. Okay? And those two groups are what we call Neanderthals and earliest modern humans, or Cro-Magnon uh, man, you might have heard. Okay? So both of these groups, Neanderthals and Cro-Magnon, are considered Homo sapiens, okay? but they are not the same. They had very different cultures and lifestyles. The Neanderthals, uh, which we first found in 1829, and you'll never need to know this date, um, they were originally found in colder climates in Europe and Western Asia. Um, and they didn't have as much food because they were living in a colder climate, there's not as much food to go around because of the cold, and therefore they had to eat a lot more animals. So these guys were primarily eating meat, which meant that they were typically stockier and stronger, both because of their diet and also because of their environmental conditions. If it's colder, you need to be a bit hardier and tougher uh, in order to survive. The remains that we find uh, on Neanderthal bodies um, show lots of little broken bones and fractures uh, because they were probably competing with other large animals a lot and getting into fights with them. We know that they had fire, they made clothes, they had tools and shelters. Um, they buried their dead with symbols, which is really a big deal. Um, we'll talk about that in a second. Okay. Uh, and they were probably the first humans, Homo sapiens, to do so. The earliest modern humans, the Cro-Magnon people, okay, um, these are us. This is us. When you talk about modern day people, modern day Homo sapiens, this is our group. Okay, um, unlike the uh, uh, Neanderthals, um, we were all over the world, not just in these colder climates, um, and so we were able to kind of adapt in a lot of different ways. We didn't have to focus on big animals and lots of meat to survive. Um, we could eat smaller animals and we could start moving into uh, eating agricultural work or agricultural produce rather than uh, focusing explicitly on meat. We also had better tools, uh, which meant that we didn't have to be as strong or as sturdy as the Neanderthals were. So because uh, we were more widespread, earliest modern humans were more widespread all over the world, we had lots of different environments which meant that we had a lot of different adaptations physically compared to the Neanderthals who were all in one spot. At some point, both of these groups were living together, but the Neanderthals start to die away and disappear. And we're not really quite sure what may have happened. Some people have thought that maybe uh, there was some interbreeding, Neanderthals interbreeded with early modern humans, and eventually the early modern humans started to outnumber the Neanderthals. 
Some people think that the Neanderthals may have been wiped out by a big climate change event or a natural disaster. And because they were all grouped up in a single spot, it hit them a lot harder than it hit um, uh, earliest modern humans who were more spread out. And some people think that um, the adaptations that earliest modern humans had made them more successful compared to uh, the Neanderthals. Early modern humans have better tech, better culture, um, their diet was better, which meant they have a higher chance of survival. Um, and we even had, we can decide, uh, we, we know that earliest modern humans had better birth and mortality rates, um, that uh, they gave birth more frequently, they died less frequently. Um, so we just were able to replace our populations better than Neanderthals were. But in the end, probably as a result of a combination of all this stuff, the Neanderthals disappear. And the last hominid group that exists on Earth is the earliest modern humans, which are our brand, our variety of Homo sapiens. It's us. And that's where we come from. So that's the quick rundown on where humans came from. Uh, we will pause here. Uh, that's the end of chapter one, section one. And when we move away or when we return for our next lecture, we'll be talking about um, how did human civilizations start? Not where did humans themselves come from, but where did human civilizations start?